talk a little bit about the kid that you mentioned at the beginning. Uh, when I was uh, young, I, I was uh, I, I love to work on things, build things. I was very fortunate to have a dad that uh, also liked to do things like this and uh, uh, had a wonderful workshop in the basement and we used to work on projects. And uh, he was very uh, fine woodworking with woodworking. Uh, my uh, uh, fort was uh, more along the technical lines as interested in radio. Uh, uh, movies, uh, photography, and uh, rocket ships. Uh, I was an avid science fiction uh, reader, and uh, I was just uh, uh, fascinated with the idea of space travel and uh, the possibility of men maybe walking on the moon someday, which uh, was an idea I think was uh, generally thought of as uh, absurd or just not possible. Uh, but I remember my dad once saying to me, almost casually said, I know, you're going to be an engineer and you'll probably go to the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Well, I was young. What a tongue twister that was. But you know, it was almost like a pronouncement. And in fact, uh, that was the uh, only college that I uh, had uh, applied to and uh, got in. I did not uh, stay there uh, through uh, I just stayed there for one semester and then transferred to uh, Rensselaer RPI in uh, Troy, New York. And uh, so uh, uh, I graduated from there in 1955 as an electrical engineer and uh, was very fortunate in, wondering, in landing a wonderful job at uh, this company called Airborne Instruments Laboratory on Long Island. And it was a company that was uh, formed uh, out of the wartime uh, laboratories at uh, MIT, the Radiation Laboratory, which developed radar during the World War II, and uh, also Columbia University, which was very much into uh, aviation electronics. <clears throat> and uh, uh, so they had formed this company and uh, it was known uh, informally as a company of engineers. And I just really felt that uh, I fitted in. And uh, so now, Vaughn, if you'll just wait on a second, I'm gonna get ready with the first uh, slide that I have here. Okay, I was not uh, at Airborne for uh, probably a little more than a year than uh, the Russians lofted their uh, Sputnik satellite into space. Of course, it made headlines in the New York Times. And uh, it was uh, really, uh, I, uh, for me, it just the whole world seemed to change, uh, particularly for me. And I felt that uh, I was uh, very much uh, in the right place at the right time. Uh, it wasn't long before I was on a project uh, with uh, NASA. It was probably a couple of years after that got started on a, uh, a satellite program. Uh, we had some early rocket experiments to loft a, a, a sounding rocket and later a satellite uh, into uh, space uh, above the ionosphere, which is the electrified electric uh, layer in the uh, above the stratosphere that uh, reflects radio signals for shortwave radio. And uh, this project was in concert with the National Bureau of Standards, now part of uh, NOAA. And uh, they were wanting to explore the structure of the ionosphere by doing radio soundings from above, known as the topside sounder. And uh, the first part of the project was to launch some sounding rockets. And uh, this is just a little show of uh, 
the first one that we sent off, which was uh, really uh, important, and it turned out to be a scientific first. Uh, we uh, had a, a small payload that we put on top of a sounding rocket, and uh, that Wallops Island, it wasn't anything like Cape Canaveral. It's a very informal place uh, and uh, not not uh, very technologically advanced, but it was used for a lot of scientific research of the upper atmosphere uh, with sounding rockets and later with satellites. Here we are, uh, two of the crew uh, taking the payload, the uh, sounding experiment and putting it on top of a uh, of the sounding rocket, which now here you can see standing. It was, it's uh, made up of four sections. Uh, it's called the Javelin rocket. And this would take us up to seven to 800 miles straight up. It's an unguided missile. It just uh, is spin stabilized and goes all the way up. And uh, it doesn't look like much, but when it took off, it came off with a huge roar. And here is uh, one of them. Uh, this is what it looks like taking off. And uh, uh, it just goes straight up and then does the experiment and then falls back to Earth by, I'd say, about uh, between 15 and 20 minutes it would come back. And it was indeed a scientific first. The first pulse soundings of the top side of the ionosphere. and. Uh, uh, Robert Connect and Tom Van Zant were the scientific uh, researchers at the Bureau of Standards, and uh, I was uh, heading the project at Airborne. Also, about the same time, and this was in 1961, uh, this particular launching was of Alan Shepard. It was the first suborbital flight uh, of the Man in Space program. And uh, at that point, we had a new hero. Uh, this flight was, the flight was successful and uh, came back down, uh, splashed down, and uh, he was brought aboard the ship and brought home and uh, awarded, uh, he was a hero, he was awarded the, uh, the, uh, 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 the Freedom Award by uh, President Kennedy at that time. And there was a huge ovation over her. There was a ticker tape parade down uh, Fifth Avenue and in other places as well. And uh, this, his flight had taken off on May 5th of 61. And it was just 20, 20 uh, days later that Kennedy uh, spoke his challenge to the nation to send a man to the moon. It was a very exciting time. Uh, I was in a wonderful place uh, with the company I was with, but somehow I just wanted to go on and uh, be on the Apollo project. I just, it was such an opportune time and uh, something that I just wanted to be a part of. And I found myself in 1964 as a flight controller on a Gemini 4 mission off in the South Pacific on a converted Liberty ship. Uh, we were a flight control team. There were six of us, actually, the picture on the left. Uh, I'm standing uh, a longer, you know, I, should, I should say a younger version of myself on the left. And then our Capcom, uh, Keith Kundell, and two uh, uh, of the uh, aeromedical guys, and uh, they're both doctors and an engineer. And uh, the Liberty, sh the, uh, the Rose Knot Victor was the name of the ship. It was an old Liberty ship, which had been built in World War II and it was converted for space, uh, space uh, monitoring and uh, had all kinds of electronic equipment, uh, which I'll show you a bit of it later. It just happened at the last moment. We didn't know this until we were on station out in the Pacific that this was going to be the first uh, the spacewalk by Ed White. And uh, here's a little video of him uh, going. Oh, they opened up the uh, Gemini capsule. 
and he is just flying out there by himself. He says he felt like a million dollars. And I remember hearing the chatter on the flight control loop that uh, they were trying to get him back in. He didn't want to come back. He was having such a great time. But anyway, they did, they did get, get him back in. And it was time for us to uh, start with our duties, which were in the night. And what happened with the uh, Gemini program, this particular launch, it was Gemini 4, it was the first mission to last longer than a day. It was four days, and in fact, and uh, as the Earth rotates into, uh, when we go into nighttime, the, uh, the uh, orbit over which the Gemini 4 was traveling was away from all of the tracking stations that could control and listen to them. So they had this control ship, Liberty ship, uh, the Rose Knot out in the South Pacific where we were. And so we were the only contact that with the uh, capsule uh, for four nights. And there would be about four or five passes over which uh, we, uh, we were uh, uh, in contact with the spacecraft and also with a brand new mission control in Houston, which was just being set up at that time. We had, uh, there was a control room inside of the ship. Uh, on the left is a photo of one of the engineers with a whole batch of readings that could be read. Uh, telemetry would come down and activate these meters and uh, they could be seen how the spacecraft itself was doing. And then there are other stations uh, for uh, the uh, Capcom, myself, and uh, one other. And on the left is the equipment room, which was on the ship. And this was all about the communications with the satellite, uh, bringing down the voice and the telemetry from the satellite, and also keeping in touch with uh, uh, mission control in Houston. Now, just to give you an idea how crude it was in this age, uh, 1964 again, uh, the uh, communication with the mission control was by shortwave radio. There were two radio links back and forth. And uh, so the mission was being handled by mission control in Houston, but with the radio links and shortwave, if anything happened with these links and you have to remember this was the analog age. There were no digital uh, communications. There were no uh, satellites to communicate through uh, the, way there the way there would be later. Uh, so if anything happened to those radio links, then we were mission control. Uh, and that's why there were the doctors and a Capcom and all on board the ship. So that if anything did go wrong with the communication with the uh, uh, with mission control, we would be it and be in control. Uh, I might just say, I said we really didn't have much in the way of digital communications. Uh, it was teletype and voice. And teletype is about 110 bits per second. And you can compare that to what you get on your modem uh, at home and your Wi-Fi, which is uh, in terms of megabits or millions of bits. Uh, Quite a, quite a marked uh, uh, change in that. During one of the passes, it was interesting. Uh, the doctors uh, were looking at a chart recorder, not this particular photo uh, example, but they had a chart recorder alongside of them where they could see the heartbeat of the astronauts. And I remember Fred Kelly, the one on the right, coming to the others of us uh, and saying, hey, look at this. And we went down and we looked at uh, this chart of Ed White's heartbeat. And it turned that he had arrhythmia, uh, which is an unsteady erup, uh, heartbeat. Uh, it would go boop, 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 and then pause, boop, another pause maybe, and then back to the regular rhythm. And it was just really one of the most 
uh, memories that is really frozen in mind at that time. Because here we were looking at this chart of the uh, heartbeat of uh, uh, Ed White and thinking at the same time of the scale upon which all of this was happening. Uh, we were uh, 300 miles southwest of Lima, Peru. This satellite was uh, about a couple of hundred miles overhead and traveling at four miles per second. And here we were sitting, uh, keeping, keeping, uh, keeping an eye on them, looking over on them. And it was just that, that frozen image of this huge expanse upon which this was happening and us looking down on such a small scale of just watching the heartbeat. It was a fascinating moment for me. Uh, I was down in Houston for a little over a year, but uh, uh, a former boss that I had in uh, Airborne Instruments Lab, uh, he, uh, he was, had now moved to RCA, Astro Electronic Division in Princeton. And uh, he heard that I was in uh, Houston and uh, working as a flight controller and uh, was in touch with me and said, look, we have something really good going here at RCA. Oh, at, in any event, we'd like to have you come up here and talk with us and uh, see what you think. So uh, I did. And uh, I decided to come back and uh, go with RCA. And it sounded like they had exciting projects. I'm showing you a slide of one project that I did head. It was a small uh, developmental project. It was called the laser tracker, and it was basically like a small radar, which could follow optically uh, anything on the moon's surface. Now, here we were on an Indian reservation in Arizona, and uh, we were tracking a uh, rehearsal of the kind of geology that could be done on the moon just working with the idea that uh, if you go to the moon and you do experiments, you have to really analyze the experiments. And if you want to make any decisions and look at other things, you had to do it at the same time. In other words, you had to do science in real time. Uh, you couldn't go do a, uh, a, uh, an experiment and then sit down and think about it for six months and write a paper on it and then publish and then maybe continue with the uh, work later. It had to be done in real time. So this was work that was done by the astrogeology branch of uh, the, of the uh, Department of the Interior. And uh, it was uh, headed by uh, uh, Gene Shoemaker, a famous astronomer. You may have heard his name. and. Uh, also, under his tutelage was uh, Jack Schmidt, who was to become an Apollo astronaut in uh, the uh, Apollo 17 mission. He would be the only scientist that would go to the moon. But here, we're shown tracking an object. Hold on a minute. This is the roving vehicle that they were doing their experiments on. It had nothing to do with what went to the moon, but uh, here, <clears throat> it was uh, um, they would drive around and they would stop as astronauts would and examine a particular area. And what this laser tracker would do would follow a special reflector on that vehicle. And it had a television camera, which can be seen off to the uh, left-hand side of it. Uh, this was the uh, optical unit. It was a really a small telescope. And these were encoders which measured the angles, both the uh, altitude and the azimuth uh, that the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, the uh, razor, laser tracker was looking at. And I'm just going to hold on just for a moment. I'm going to mute my microphone and clear my throat.
Okay, I think that's a little bit better for me right now. Uh, thank you for the pause. So it was going to be something that was carried to the moon and uh, it uh, turned out that it would be cut. Although it was an RCA project and it was uh, the laser in the uh, telescope was a uh, new development at RCA laboratories and it was something that literally came out of the labs to be put into this in hopes that uh, we could uh, uh, do flight hardware and take something like this to the moon that could follow the astronauts with a camera and to uh, take all of the data of where they were, uh, including range and azimuth and elevation of where they were at any given time. Uh, it did not happen though, uh, but uh, other projects that were interesting, particularly in the, uh, in the idea of television were uh, First, the uh, Block 1 camera, which is a camera RCA made. And this was in the command module during a mission. And uh, there were little, uh, there were small, uh, uh, opportunities, small opportunistic uh, press conferences with the crew on uh, the Apollo missions using this camera inside of the command module, not outside or on the moon. Uh, it was a small camera and uh, <clears throat> it was a low resolution camera, only 320 TV lines. Uh, it operated at a frame rate of 10 frames a second, whereas normal television is 30 a second. And the first time it was used was on Apollo 7 with uh, Wally Shira, uh, the commander, in October of 1968. There were several conferences in Earth orbit for this. Uh, and when this television came down to uh, the Earth, uh, it had to be converted into the standard television a uh, signal of 30 uh, frames a second and uh, uh, the resolution could not be improved but it was the, it was the uh, means of uh, really transcoding uh, the uh, TV signal from this uh, camera to uh, the uh, standard broadcast standards. Apollo 8 was also, was also another mission that this uh, camera was used on. This is kind of a complicated diagram. Uh, we're looking down at the North Pole of the Earth here and also the North Pole of the Moon and showing how the slingshot mode, the translunar injection into a lunar orbit, they could either go around and just do a swing by and it was called a free run, a free return re trajectory, or if everything was working properly, they could go into lunar orbit. And it turned out that they did go into lunar orbit. And this is just a still of looking out through the window of the command module with that block two camera showing the uh, lunar surface as they were flying over it. And uh, you may remember this was on Christmas Eve in 1968. And there was a reading that the astronauts gave from uh, Genesis in the Bible. It was also when this beautiful photograph was taken of what they called Earthrise, the uh, Earth uh, coming up as if a moon, but shot around along the moon surface of the earth appearing to rise out of the sky and uh, it was uh, just a uh, first time that you could see the earth really as a as a planet all by itself everything that we have oh, and all people and everything that we know being on that planet earth seen just as the blue blue the um, as it was called a blue marble
I want to linger on this slide a little bit. This is the uh, ground commanded television assembly. There was a camera and a control unit that was built to go on a roving vehicle on the moon on Apollo 15. Now, Apollo 11 was the first landing. Apollo 15 was one of the later, they called them J missions, where they could bring more equipment uh, and uh, have longer stays on the moon than was previously allowed. So a lot was expected of the uh, 15, uh, 15 flight. Uh, the camera here, shown in photograph on the left and a diagram on the right showing how the camera can tilt up and down by control remotely from uh, mission control, uh, can be rotated, uh, it can be panned around. It, we have other zoom control and uh, iris control and a few other controls on the camera. Sam, actually, you're you're muted, Sam. There we go. Okay, I'm unmuted now. Uh, the uh, bottom of the cam bottom of the camera is shown all wrapped in this called super insulation. It's uh, layers of uh, uh, fiberglass cloth web and uh, Mylar, mylar coating, uh, mirrored coating, silver mylar coating with a gold color on the bottom. This insulates the bottom part of the camera and the side part from the hot surface of the moon. And it's a way of controlling the temperature of the uh, camera itself. On top are little glass mirrors, which uh, can radiate heat uh, and reflect the sunlight. So if the sunlight hits it, it's just reflected off and most of the energy in the sunlight is in the visible range. But in the infrared range, uh, this uh, surface is, is like black and radiates heat from the camera outwards. So when the camera is working, that works as a radiator to keep it cool, radiating the cooled into, uh, into outer space. Uh, when the camera is off, the camera is tilted downward so that that radiating surface looks at some of the uh, of the uh, lunar surface, which is which is hot, uh, and uh, which can keep the camera warm. So by tilting the camera up or down, the temperature can be controlled inside. Okay, continuing on. Uh, a unit also at the front of the rover was a suitcase size unit called the communication unit. And uh, this took the camera signal from the camera and could broadcast it back to Earth and also do all the communications between the astronaut and the Earth uh, or through the lunar module. Uh, and it was, a, <clears throat> it was a unit that along with one more piece of equipment, the high gain antenna, which is an umbrella like uh, parabolic antenna that would be aimed at earth. So all of these units, the color camera, the control unit, which is at the base of it, the communication relay unit, which is on the basically the front bumper, bumper of the rover, and the high gain antenna, which would beam the signal to Earth. This was a complete broadcast unit right on the front edge of the, of the rover so that communications could be done directly with the Earth, sending the television signal down to uh, 
tracking stations of the Deep Space Network, large 210-foot dishes in Goldstone, California, in Australia, and in Madrid, Spain. So depending upon how the Earth had rotated during the uh, 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 activity that they had on the moon, they would be able to be picked up by one of these three big antennas uh, on the Earth. And here it is on a just a, all set up uh, with the astronauts that would go on Apollo 15. Uh, uh, Dave Scott, on, Dave Scott on the right, who was the commander of Apollo 15 mission to be, and Jim Irwin, who was the lunar pilot, lun, lunar module pilot, sitting on the left. And in front, you can see the uh, the whole. RCA installation on the front of the of the uh, rover buggy. So Apollo 15 held a lot of promise. I had sat down with Dave Lockenbrook, who was a writer for the uh, TV guide, and gave him this story. And they came up with a wonderful story about uh, how the moon cast was going to be and uh, and as it says on that uh, highlight on the cover, just like being there. And our effort had been to make it look as good as the afternoon ball game, if we possibly could. Uh, there were uh, many things to think about. And I remember sitting down in building 440, which is the TV lab at Houston, uh, waiting to do the, for the first EVA, that's the uh, first exploration out of the lunar module uh, onto the lunar surface for Apollo 15. A little drink of water helps. Thinking back to Apollo on previous missions, Apollo 11, we saw the astronaut uh, first step onto the moon. Uh, and this was a uh, taken from television, but it was refined. It was uh, uh, worked on so that you could see the uh, astronaut uh, the camera actually worked perfectly on Apollo 11, but the uh, some reason the, through the transmission to Earth reception, uh, actually it was received on the Earth at Australia in very good uh, quality. But what was seen on the certainly the screen that I saw. It looked more like this. This was what uh, was generally transmitted to the public and to the world for Apollo 11, so that it was really difficult to see. And uh, it's really uh, kind of sad that the master tape that was recorded at uh, Australia was lost, somehow not cataloged properly, and somewhere in the vast uh, resources of uh, the storage at NASA, uh, they could never find the original tapes. So they had to uh, re kind of, uh, through uh, image processing, uh, recreate something that came closer to what the video actually would have looked like. So it was too bad that, that Apollo 11 had that happen to it. Apollo 11, instead of one step, this was one misstep. As the color camera was taken from the lower equipment bay of the module after they had gone out on their first EVA, uh, the astronaut, it turns out it was Albine, had taken the camera out of this, the uh, rack from which it had been transported to the moon and swung it around to put it on a tripod so that their activities could be watched. And it just happened to 
the way the swing happened, it just went by so that the sun actually shone on the very sensitive pickup tube of that camera. And that ended TV for that whole uh, mission, Apollo, Apollo 12. There was no lunar surface uh, video after that happened. Now, Apollo 13, of course, never landed. So there is no video from that. Uh, it was lucky that uh, crew was rescued from that mission. It was a great, great uh, flight control uh, success that they were able to bring that ship back. Apollo 14 suffered from another problem of uh, the uh, exposure on the astronauts uh, was such that their images bloom, bloomed. They were much brighter in their spacesuits than was the dark surface of the moon. And so that the image tend to bloom and you could not see any detail of the astronauts themselves. And this is a real problem that we saw in Apollo 14 and which we uh, attempted to uh, improve. One of the things we did was to check our light control, automatic light control. We had two modes. One was called peak, in which the uh, camera would set up the exposure for the brightest object in the scene, here being a little model of the astronaut, or average, which is just takes the average illumination of the scene so that we could see into shadowed areas. If an astronaut were behind a rock, we could see him. Uh, and these tests that we ran turned out to be an important thing to get away with the problem of blooming, which was a characteristic of all television cameras at that point. Uh, there was no way to uh, have a uh, object that you were focusing on if it looked, if it was too bright and could not be adjusted, uh, it would, the image would spread and it would look, well, we called it the Casper the Ghost look, and we didn't want to have any of that. We had thought we had solved it. There were many other worries. Uh, we had uh, tested the camera thoroughly, but uh, in looking at the latest technology, you would be surprised by the number of wires and individual transistors there were in this camera. Now, this was uh, built in uh, 1970. Uh, we got the contract at RCA in the summer, August it was in 1970, and uh, we built uh, the camera, tested it, and uh, flew it in less than a year. Uh, by today's standard, it was uh, very crude, but uh, it was a real advance, uh, really shoehorning, shoehorning all of the technology of a high quality camera into something of a shoebox size. And we had a color wheel. Now you might ask why we would use that technology. It would have been impossible to have a three tube. There were no such things as solid state image sensors at that time. Uh, and keep a three tube color camera in registration over the translunar journey and uh, beside, there would no way to get something that was uh, small enough, light enough, and reliable enough uh, to have color television on the moon without resorting to this field sequential uh, color. So this wheel would uh, rotate it at 10 revolutions per second, 60, uh, 600 RPM, and uh, it would put a, uh, color filter in front of the image tube as uh, the image tube was scanning its image. And it worked uh, very reliable. The only shortcoming was that uh, if the uh, motor has, if, if the motor didn't start, froze up for any reason, then we were in real trouble. Uh, as we sat waiting for the image to, uh, the camera to be turned on in Apollo 13, 15, 
uh, we were on the lunar surface uh, overnight and the uh, first uh, extravehicular activity was to begin at 815. They were going to climb down the ladder on the lunar module and uh, start uh, their first uh, mission on the moon. The first uh, sense we had that uh, everything was working, we did get telemetry from the camera, which told us that the wheel was turning on and told us that the temperature inside of the camera was a very comfortable 29 degrees Fahrenheit. So here is what we got coming down the ladder. Dave, an extraordinary television picture here. Okay, uh, extraordinary television. Okay, Houston, as I stand out here in the wonders of the unknown at Hadley, I sort of realize there's a fundamental truth to our nature. Man must explore. And this is exploration at, at its greatest. Well, you can believe that we were really happy at that. <laughs> uh, it was like waiting for a launch, <laughs> a mini launch at that one, but uh, it really uh, was uh, 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 just wonderful to see that image come up on the camera. No matter how much testing you do, you always have the wonder, is it going to work? And uh, indeed, uh, we had those jitters and just waiting, and uh, it was just wonderful to see an image that came on, a uh, nice black uh, dark sky behind, uh, a lot of detail on the astronaut in his spacesuit, uh, the ladder. And this was when the camera was in the uh, lower equipment bay on the uh, lunar module, so that when that bay door was open, the camera would look up at the ladder, but it couldn't really look around at that point. From that point, it had to be taken out and placed on the roving vehicle. And here we have uh, the roving vehicle that has been deployed off of the, uh, the uh, limb. This is a little sequence showing the camera has been put on the uh, on the uh, lunar rover vehicle. You can also see uh, that uh, you can see where the communication unit here and the antenna here are all set up. This had all to be taken out of the equipment bay and placed on the roving vehicle so that we could go ahead with that. This is just a little sequence showing uh, the lunar rover vehicle, rover rowing vehicle going. This was taken on film, of course. Uh, we're at a stop where the astronauts are doing an exploration of some rocks. The camera follows by control from mission control. Right here, Al Pennington is at the controls. He have a big monitor and he has push button controls of the camera so that he can pan and tilt and zoom. And this last shot is really a test of the camera that we got the exposure control right uh, with a dark moon soil in the foreground and the bright images of the astronauts uh, we were able to automatically get the right exposure on them so that you can still, still see their detail. Uh, and it's kind of a really test of, uh, yeah, it worked the way we had designed it to work and it did do that in actuality. This picture is kind of a favorite of mine. There was a NASA picture that looked like this, but this was really a painting uh, by Al 
uh, uh, by uh, uh, one of the astronauts, uh, Al Bean. Uh, he became quite an art artist after coming back, after uh, being on Apollo. He was on Apollo 12 uh, and came in to be quite a, an artist of repute on uh, uh, really depicting some of the lunar things seen that he's seen on the moon. And uh, this kind of says it all for the RCA equipment, uh, enabled the entire Earth to view uh, what was going on. And it was estimated at times that the uh, television audience was probably around 500 million people at its peak. Uh, so uh, uh, I think this picture for me kind of says it all. This is just kind of a uh, interesting picture. Uh, one taken by the TV, the other by camera. Uh, one astronaut jumping up and uh, caught by the film camera on the left and then by the TV camera on the right. At the end of their stay, uh, their stay having been four days, the uh, launch of Apollo 15 was on July 26th, 1971. Uh, the uh, first EVA, that's first uh, getting out of the capsule and doing the exploration, was on the 31st of uh, July. And uh, on August 3rd, they were ready to come back home. And this drawing just shows how the camera can be set on the uh, rover, controlled at mission control, uh, can view the launch of the ascent stage to go back and meet up with the uh, spacecraft in orbit around the moon. Uh, and uh, that uh, the, the moon rover, the uh, moon buggy would also transmit this directly to Earth, not through the, uh, through the, uh, upper stage of the uh, lunar uh, module, which was busy with getting back into orbit at that time. Now, here we are. Uh, we had trouble on Apollo 15. It, uh, with As the days progressed, the clutch, which uh, was engage the uh, elevation of the camera had uh, loosened due to the heat. And at one point during the EVA, the camera tipped all the way back by itself. And it was feared that uh, the, uh, if we tried to follow the spacecraft to the ascent stage up as it went up, uh, that it would just flop up and the camera could no longer be used because there would be nobody to help it back. Uh, during the mission when this happened, uh, one of the astronauts just grabbed, was able to grab it and get it back. And uh, after that, uh, we kept the camera level. But uh, at this point, it was decided, we'll just watch it take off from its platform. Watch stage, engine arm basket. 99 Pro. And this is what it looked like from mission control. Uh, the music actually was played from the ascent stage of the lunar module as they were taking off. Uh, they had a recording of the uh, uh, Air Force uh, uh, song, uh, Off We Go. Uh, and uh, they played it through the, uh, their, uh, their uh, astronaut loop. And this is what it looked like uh, uh, in mission control. They had a huge uh, screen showing it, uh, showing it all. Now, this is Apollo 17, uh, a different mission. There were 15, 16, and 17. 
uh, the last mission was uh, uh, with uh, Gene Cernan, who was the commander, and Jack Schmidt, who was the uh, astronaut geologist that I spoke of earlier, uh, who uh, went along and became an astronaut, learned uh, to fly and all of that. Uh, so this was the last of uh, that uh, uh, mission and actually the last mission on the moon. Apollo 17 was the wrap up. And uh, this also, this shot uh, was uh, kind of to show, I, I put it in just to show how the mission control had actually contrived to uh, program the camera so that it would follow and track the uh, upper stage up as it went as it went vertically up and then pitched over and started shooting horizontally uh, and you will hear them talk about pitch over that's what they mean where the uh, they, they go from going up to getting a horizontal speed to put them back into uh, orbit around uh, the moon to meet up with the command module here we go Army I'm gonna get the pro 99, proceeded, 3, 2, 1, Houston. Right away, Houston. That's your good. Back shot. Get over. I hear you have good fun. Okay, 30 seconds. That's Gene Cernan and Jack Schmidt. And with his wave of the hand. It's an army death, I'm gonna get the pro. No, let's see. Uh, with a wave of the hand, Jack Schmidt, I'll just say thank you and I'll take any questions that you have at this point. Thanks very much. All right, thank you so much, uh, Sam. We actually have a few questions already in the Q&A and uh, one more from Facebook Live. So uh, we'll start with the first one from Peter Wise, who wanted to know who the boss was when you first joined RCA. Who was my boss? First was RCA. Yeah, who was the person who, I think it was who's the person who invited you over from Houston to RCA. Oh, uh, it was George Barna. George Barna was uh, head of the uh, mechanical design section of the, uh, of, of, of uh, no, wait a minute. I, he, he was a pretty high up uh, there. He was a very, very capable guy. And uh, uh, there were a number of uh, engineering departments under him. Uh, he was at, uh, at uh, Airborne. He, uh, was really second in command of the uh, the uh, spacecraft development. Uh, they were doing some classified projects, mostly at that point. Uh, the project I worked on was a smaller project and one which uh, they uh, they put me in command of uh, 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 as we uh, ended the uh, rocket uh, rocket uh, tests there. Uh, so I can't give you George Barna's title, but uh, he's a great guy and uh, later on moved to, uh, mm, gee, I can't remember. Uh, but it was, uh, I was still at RCA at the time he left Airborne. So uh, the time that I was down in Houston, he was uh, at RCA, but he heard about me uh, being there in uh, Houston and uh, just, uh, got in touch with me and tapped me on the shoulder, say, hey, we have something really going here. Uh, why don't you give us some consideration? And I did. Great. All right, so um, next, um, someone wanted to know a little bit about the artifacts related to this talk. So I think I'm gonna take this one. Um, so we have, uh, in the Sarnoff collection, we have 
not the original cameras, obviously, those are still on the moon because you saw the, the cameras being used. Uh, but we have models of the last three Apollo mission um, cameras. Um, they are, are non-functioning prototypes, uh, but they were signed by all of the astronauts. Uh, we also have some of the uh, models for the uh, the the cameras that were used only inside of the module, those small grayish ones. Uh, we have a couple of models of those. Those models seem to be a dime a dozen. If you go to the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum, you see a whole wall of RCA uh, prototype like uh, cameras for, for those. Um, yeah, so that's what we have in the collection. It is currently on display, but currently the museum is, is closed. Uh, but we hope that you can see them in person uh, once we get to the museum. Okay, so the next question that we have, um, I think there's two that are very similar. Um, Bob uh, Kaplow wants to know if the antenna was aimed manually and uh, Jeffrey Beck wanted to know how the high gain antenna track the earth while the rover was moving over the moon well uh the uh, there was there was not a steerable antenna on the rover uh as a matter of fact it was proposed that there be one and uh i remember being interviewed uh for uh, it was during uh, uh the apollo 15. Uh, we had been talking about having a steerable antenna on it uh, but it never uh, got to uh be uh, uh, implemented. It was just too big a project, uh, too difficult, and uh, money was uh, beginning to get scarce at that point in the uh, Apollo program. But how it was steered, there was an optical telescope. Uh, I don't know if you can really see it. I could try going back to uh, uh, at at. Uh, it was a little telescope, a, a, a lot, it was very close to the center of the uh, umbrella antenna that you could look through and uh, sight the earth. And uh, once the rover was stopped, then once you aimed the antenna, uh, you'd be home free. But I understand that uh, the astronauts used uh, the signal strength mirror. They could pretty well uh, gauge uh you know where where they needed to point the antenna the earth was you know pretty visible and they could uh once they were somewhere near the uh, uh pointing it oh, at the God. earth uh, they would be able to uh, uh just look at the signal strength mirror uh, a meter and uh adjust it so that it was right on for maximum signal so it was manually done and the astronauts chose to do it by uh, the signal looking at the signal strength rather than using the telescope finder that they had on the antenna. Okay. Um, our next question actually comes from a Facebook uh, live viewer. Um, so Ed Bishop wants you to or asks if you can reflect on the fact that two astronauts are just now on the International Space Station in a live interview. So their entire trip uh, was televised live. So he wants you to, to reflect a little on the changes in telecommunications you've seen in your lifetime. Wow. <laughs> that's a big question. That's a, that's a tall order. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, the, uh, the communications for the, uh, uh, I, I don't know whether you can make really uh, much of a, I, I don't know how you compare the two uh, with what we have today. Uh, certainly, I think everything is digital. Uh, voice communication is digital. Uh, telemetry is, uh, uh, oh, vastly improved over what it was. Uh, the uh, communication system on Apollo was called the unified S-band system. So there was one signal going up. It was at about 2100 megahertz uh, and the downlink was 2200. Uh, those are not exact numbers, but that's the range of uh, the uh, uh, signals. So they were S-band signals and they carried the uh, uh, the uplink, uh, <clears throat> uplink and downlink voice, uh, the 
uh, they ordered, they uh, had updates to the, <clears throat> to the uh, computer on the uh, command module and on the, uh, on the lunar module. Uh, and uh, they had all telemetry uh, down. Uh, they had commands to the computers on both the uh, lunar module and the command module. They had telemetry down from both of those, uh, those units. And uh, there was a pseudo-random code which is used in tracking, which was sent up and turned around and sent back down. And uh, uh, a pseudo-random code enabled them to basically use it as a yardstick. They could, by uh, being able to correlate the code coming back, they could tell exactly how long the, by the time delay, exactly what the distance was. Uh, to the spacecraft they were looking at and back. So that was one of the most important uh, or the most accurate of the measurements that they could make for tracking. Uh, having that code round trip uh, was ex exceedingly important uh, to the, uh, uh, the tracking and the ability to compute orbits and, uh, and all. Uh, so that was all, it was quite an advanced system for its time. I think uh, uh, there was some analog on that. Uh, now it's all digital. Uh, I think one of the big things has changed both in television and uh, communications is the uh, uh, remarkable uh, abilities that you can create in solid state circuitry uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, make communications that are exceedingly small. I mean, look at your iPhone, what you're able to do with it. Uh, it's just, I think the iPhone is extraordinary uh, in comparison to uh, what, we, uh, what we think of uh, as uh, uh, communication systems in the 60s. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we've got uh, a couple more questions. Two of them are, I think, pretty similar, so I'm going to bundle them. Uh, Jonathan Allen wanted to know uh, what frequency bands were used for lunar communications. Uh, he says it looks like X-band, but can you ascertain that or not? And what was the transmitter power on the moon? That's from Gary. Okay. <clears throat> there are a few questions in there. Okay, never mind then. Uh, no, 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 hold on. Uh, uh, the, the uplink and downlink were S-band, as I said. Uh, in 2100 megahertz, uh, 2100, no, 20, yeah, 2100 megahertz uplink. I think it was 2180 or something like that. I don't know the exact. And then down, uh, all of the uh, communication on the moon between the lunar module and the astronauts uh, was a uh, V. Yeah, very high frequency, VHF, VHF. Uh, I'm inclined to say VHS, which is videotape, uh, VHF. Uh, I don't know the exact frequencies, probably around 240 megahertz on the moon. Uh, and then what was the last part of the question? Um, the transmitter power on the moon. What, what was the transmitter power on the moon, they ask? between five and 10 watts. Cool. All right. So last uh, question slash comment. Uh, I'll just read it out. I remember a talk, Jock McFarland says, uh, by George Brown, where he told that after the, where he was told that after the first moon mission, RCA Brass was upset that RCA didn't get the credit they thought it deserved. They mentioned this to the TV announcers. So that after the sun flash on the next mission, the TV commenters remarked that the RCA camera didn't work. Uh, was there a lot of that the, due to the sort of, I guess, user error, you might call it, um, people were blaming RCA's technology? Uh, I don't know uh, exactly what uh, went on about that. I, I know there was a lot of competition <clears throat> the way uh, the whole TV came to RCA in the beginning it was just because they were there with television in space. Uh, and uh, when the uh, contract was let to 
North American Aviation. They were the contractor for the uh, command, command module and the camera, a block one camera was in the contract. Uh, there was some argument as to whether it would be uh, uh, RCA or Westinghouse. Or Westinghouse, was, was trying, Westinghouse was trying to get uh, in with uh, their technology. Uh, they did uh, uh, eventually convince NASA that for the moon surface that they had this wonderful uh, silicon, it's, it's an SEC Viticon, which stands for uh, Secondary Electron Emission. Uh, the SEC, yeah. Secondary electro, uh, electron cathode in the, uh, the cathode in the, which is the pickup surface of their camera tube uh, was uh, of that type where electrons from the scanning beam would, uh, there would be some scattering, backscattering inside of that imaging tube and collected, uh, which uh, turned out to be a tube of extraordinary sensitivity. But uh, the problem was shown in Apollo 12 that uh, although it would probably work very well on the moon in very dark regions, uh, when it, uh, I think it was Alvin that turned the camera around and just happened to hit the sun. The uh, cathode was so delicate that it just, it ruined it. And uh, what the image I showed uh, on the right-hand side was just a fixed image. There was nothing to it other than if you wanted to look at the TV, it was just that fixed image that came down. And after that, uh, NASA was looking for uh, a tube which would be impervious to sunlight and yet be sensitive. And RCA mounted a, uh, a, a project <coughs> in Lancaster, Pennsylvania to create the silicon intensified target tube, which is what that camera had, which uh, would, uh, was shown to uh, withstand uh, the sun. It was pointed to the sun for minutes at, in a test and uh, still still worked. Uh, they wanted to be absolutely sure that that was not going to happen again. Understandable, yes. All right, so that's all the questions on the Q and A uh, list. Um, I did one. I did have one question. I suppose curators' prerogative to ask. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk about a little bit about CBS's response to the fact that RCA was using the color wheel technology. After all, uh, CBS was trying really hard to push for color television using the field sequential system, the color wheel system that RCA soundly rejected, of course, until they used it themselves uh, for the Apollo cameras. Did you, uh, I think, uh, Well, last... uh, let, me, let me say this. I, uh, I, I remember the, uh, that uh, CBS was in there, every mission, every mission uh, where there was television and an RCA camera or a, uh, any any at all, uh, CBS would always have a press release about it was being their system. And uh, in fact, uh, their system was uh, uh, not just the color wheel itself, but the system was an incompatible system with uh, the uh, national standard <clears throat> when color was coming into view as a viable option for broadcasting. Uh, and I guess you know all about that part of it. Uh, and I, th I think RCA looked at it while we're, we're using a color wheel and I would think it was really the uh, uh, NASA that decided that the color wheel was the way to go. Uh, and using a color wheel did not say that it was really the CBS system, uh, okay. but there always was an argument uh, and always a, uh, always a, uh, uh, of uh, uh, our uh, CBS spoke up at every mission about uh, their uh, color wheel, their color system. 
right. Well, thank you so very much uh, for agreeing to do this talk. And thanks to all of the listeners on, I guess, various platforms that we have going uh, for tuning in. Um, and thanks so much. Okay. Uh, again. I apologize for the rusty voice. I don't know what happened to it. Uh, but uh, I just had to uh, mute myself a little bit and take a drink of water uh, and clear my throat. Um, I hope everybody could understand all then. Uh, so thanks very much. I really enjoyed being on. All right. Well, uh, thanks. Thank you all. And hopefully we'll see you at the next talk. Uh, bye, everybody.